Hi class, good morning. Welcome to the first lectures on electrodynamics. And uh, by the way, our reference for uh, this lecture is um, the book titled uh, Introduction to Electrodynamics by Electrodynamics by David J. Griffiths. Um, the book is uh, protected by copyright, so I recommend that you buy this book. And um, most of the materials that will be included in the lectures uh, will be taken from this um, book. So it's better for you to have one because the details of the lectures would be uh, there. More details. So as a start, we don't start yet the formal um, lectures on electrodynamics, but we, I, I will just give you some uh, first, in the first few minutes of our lecture, I'll give you some preliminaries about uh, electrodynamics. So we start with chapter zero. What is electrodynamics? And uh, by the way, how does it really uh, fit into the scheme, scheme of things in physics? So we'll start with the four realms of mechanics. We know that, uh, I mean, you know, you have studied about classical mechanics, which was mostly of Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. And then you also studied about special relativity, which was discovered by Einstein. And then you have uh, quantum mechanics, which is a consol consolidation of the studies of Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger and all others. And then you also have um, quantum field theory by Dirac, Pauli, Feynman, and Schrodinger. Quantum field theory is actually um, very, it's part of the menu of particle physics. So if you go particle physics, this is uh, one of the things that you have to study. So classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics holds true for objects um, with low speeds. Like for example, a car running on the street that is uh, well described by Newtonian mechanics. But Newtonian mechanics is um, not enough or insufficient for objects moving very fast, near the speed of light. So Newtonian mechanics or classical mechanics fails in that aspect for objects moving near the speed of light. So you have to incorporate special relativity of Einstein in order to describe um, objects moving very fast. So some or if not some, many of the equations in classical mechanics will have to be modified and they have to include um, the speed of light in their um, uh, expression. For example, energy. Energy would be very simple in uh, Newtonian mechanics, but energy in special relativity, you have uh, in the expression E square is equal to m squared c to the fourth plus momentum squared times the speed of light squared. So it would be different in uh, special relativity. Also, uh, classical mechanics does not work well with objects that are very small. So if you have a very small object like uh, the size of the atom, Classical mechanic fails there. So you have to do, uh, or you have to describe it using quantum mechanics. So Newtonian mechanics fails in fast objects and also small sized objects. But um, the approximation would be classical mechanics. 
So if you want to study about um, particles that are very small and are very fast, you have to combine special relativity and quantum mechanics here. Quantum mechanics and special relativity. And the combination of them is called the relativistic quantum mechanics or popularly known as quantum field theory. So that's, uh, this is just an introduction, by the way, don't, don't uh, get serious about it. This is just an introduction. So first few minutes of our lecture will be just about uh, introducing uh, physics to you. There are also four kinds of forces. Um, you have an object when it's um, subjected to a force, we will be able to describe what happens to an object. But our description is limited to classical mechanics yet because we don't know strong force yet and we have to study electromagnetic force and we don't know so much of the weak force also. And then there's also another force called gravitational force. So there are four forces, strong force, this force holds the protons and the neutrons together in the nucleus. So, for example, <clears throat> you have uh, protons in the nucleus. There are two protons. They have the same charges, the same type of charges, positive. They'll be repelling uh, with each other because uh, this is positive and this is positive and they have to re repel. But the strong force overpowers that uh, force, that electromagnetic force. That is uh, the electromagnetic force that's um, associated with the charges of the protons. The strong force is much stronger. That's why they, they stick together. The next, the next um, in terms of strength, the next force would be electromagnetic. Uh, this is the meat of our lectures, electromagnetic force. And these are the combined studies of Benjamin Franklin, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, Andre Marie Ampere, uh, Michael Faraday, and others. But this is completed and packaged by James Clerk Maxwell, electrodynamics. And then you have weak forces. Uh, these are forces of like, um, nuclear nuclear um, decay or radioactive decay in nuclear power plants you can experience these weak forces and then the weakest of them all is the gravitational force and they only exist or they are noticeable uh, when you have two huge masses like the planets for example they experience gravitational force with other planets or with the sun because uh, you need to have huge mass concentrations for gravitational force. This is hardly noticeable at all in, uh, in our daily lives. But well, if you throw an object upwards, it will go downwards because of the gravity. This force, since the universe is uh, composed of uh, astronomical bodies which have really large mass, this force actually dominates the entire universe. No, the entire universe, the gravitational force. So there are four forces, strong force, electromagnetic force, weak force, and gravitational force. Examples of electromagnetic forces are friction, normal force which you've studied earlier in your academic career you have chemical forces are also examples of electromagnetic force colliding forces are also examples of that and we experience most forces uh in our daily lives to be electromagnetic in nature except for gravity that's uh, another force. Um, the electrical repulsion between two electrons, if you have two electrons, there are two negative charges, they repel. 
So there's uh, what the, the term electrical repulsion there. That repulsion is actually 1,000 times, more than 1,000 times, as large as their gravitational attraction. That's how strong the electrical, electrical force is compared to the gravitational force. It's 1,000 times stronger than gravitational force. So it's like if you have a, a single hydrogen atom and if, if that atom is held together by gravity, to, for that atom to be stabilized, that hydrogen atom would be as large as the universe. Imagine if it's, uh, it's held only by gravity, it would be very big. So electrical force uh, is much stronger than gravitational force. So early on, um, years before our time, um, there the electric electricity and magnetism and magnetism were actually separate um, entities. Electricity was different, uh, magnetism was different, and they were studied separately. But uh, the discoveries of Hans Orsted, uh, he noticed that uh, the electric current could reflect magnetic compass needle so he's he he observed that there is um, a relationship between electric current and magnetic compass uh, a needle in, in when he looked at the compass and he tried to uh, put this compass near um, a wire uh, where electricity was flowing and he saw that, that there was a deflection in the compass Andre Marie Ampere postulated also that all magnetic phenomena are due to electric charges in motion. So they, the first two bullets here are related. Michael Faraday discovered that a moving magnet generates an electric current and speculated that light is also electrical in nature. Michael Faraday's discovery is opposite to that of um, Orsted and um, to that of Orsted, because he he have a moving magnet, and then that magnet was he placed it uh, in in a uh, near a wire, and then he moved that magnet near that wire, and he saw that a bulb uh, lit. There was light coming out of the bulb, and then all of these discoveries were actually um consolidated repackaged by james clerk maxwell later on in the in the succeeding lectures we will see how these are intertwined by by james clerk maxwell so actually there's also another person uh by the name of hendrix lawrence uh, both of them actually um concluded that electricity and magnetism were in inextricably intertwined so they concluded the existence of electromagnetism so that was how the electro electromagnetic of force came about you know, the unification of electricity or electric force and magnetic force um hertz <clears throat> once said that the connection between light and electricity is now established in every flame in every luminous particle we see an electrical process thus the domain of electricity extends over the whole nature the whole of nature it even affects ourselves intimately. We perceive that we possess an electrical organ, the eye, he said. Actually, Einstein uh, dreamed of unifying elect uh, electrodynamics and gravity, because as you will see 
later, electrodynamic force is actually equal to some constant times the charge, um, I mean, the electromagnetic force of two charges is equal to some constant times the charge of the first particle times the charge of the second particle divided by the distance square of the two charges. But and also gravity would have the same uh, would have a similar form because the force of gravity is equal to some constant g times the mass of a, an object and also the mass of another object over the, the square of the distance between the centers of the of those objects. They look similar. Einstein dreamed of unifying them, but he was not successful in unifying them. However, in recent years, actually in, in the 19... Uh, 60s, I guess, or 70s, electroweak theory was formulated. This electroweak theory is the unification of electric force, magnetic force, and weak forces. And this were, was successfully um, described by Blasio, Weinberg, and Salam. They won Nobel Prize in physics for this uh, unification. So it's now called electroweak. Electric theory is one of the main um, one of the mainstays in the menu of particle physics. So if you extend your knowledge to particle physics, you will be able to study electric theory alongside um, quantum field theory. But it's still that these topics are way too advanced for you now. But if you are interested, you can read uh, you can read some references about quantum field theory and electroweak theory. But for now, remember that we're just studying about electromagnetic force. Um, so uh, here's the thing. I want to describe to you first um, about, I, I mean, you know about this, but um, let me just uh, repeat them for you. The space around an electric charge, so there's a charge, no? The space around the electric charge is permeated by electric and magnetic fields, meaning the charge, if it is positive, some fields come out of the charge in all radial direction, in radial direction. So it's like a sphere, you have a point charge and the space around it is permeated by electric and magnetic field. So there's a, uh, it's like, uh, what you call this? Um, if, if you see a fruit called rambutan, those, um, those hairs of the rambutan is like the electric and magnetic fields coming out of the charge or coming into the charge if it's negative. Positive charge, they come out by convention. So these fields are, these fields by, by the first charge um, will exert a force to a neighboring charge. So if you have a second charge in the vicinity, you have a first charge uh, permeating electric and magnetic field. A second charge will be able to experience a force from the first charge. So the second charge will feel a force. Oh, there's another charge uh, beside me or on top of me or uh, below me. So the first charge permeates electric and magnetic field and the second charge experience a force because of the electric field that's given by the first charge. It's also the same for the first charge. It will also experience a force from the second charge. So the force, the, the two charges will actually experience the same force, but opposite in direction. Because the, both of them permeate 
electric and magnetic field. The fields actually mediate the two charges. They transmit influence between the two charges. The fields are also particles. The field, they, they transmit information between the two charges. So they hold the two charges together, even though they're near to each other or very far from each other. They still communicate through the fields. That uh, field would be electric and magnetic field. So when a charge accelerates, so when it's moving, a portion of the field detaches itself from the charge and travels off at a speed of light. So the, the field travels with the speed of light. That's why light is also part of electrodynamics because it's the mediating, mediating uh, field or particle between two charges. They exchange field and that field is electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is also called light. But you can, there's, there's an other types of light. You can see visible light, and then you can also see uh, infrared. I mean, you cannot see them, but you can feel infrared. Because like from the sun to your skin, the sun trans, uh, transmits infrared rays to your skin, and then temperature rising on your skin. Um, it takes charge to produce an electromagnetic field, and it takes another charge to detect that field. So when you have a charge, it produces electromagnetic field, but that electromagnetic field is detected by um, another charge. So what really is an electric charge? We know this uh, when we were younger, but uh, let me just repeat it to you. Charge comes into types. You have a positive charge and a negative charge. Uh, why is that? Why is it positive and negative? Because their effects tend to cancel at a point. So if you have a, two charges at one point, uh, you have one charge and another amount of charge. If they're of different type, they cancel, it seems like there's no charge at all at that point. So uh, that's why they're called positive and negative. And um, the same type of charge, repel, and um, opposite charges attract. So if you have two negative charges, they repel, or two positive charges, they repel. But if you have a negative and a positive charge, they attract. That means that the force, the force between the two opposite charges are going this way. They attract each other. Charge is also conserved. It cannot be created nor destroyed. The charge of the universe is conserved. It's fixed at all times. And that's what you call the global conservation of charge. But there's also local conservation of charge. Uh, for example, um, Elegant City produces like one coulomb of charge. New York would have to lose one coulomb of charge because we have um, produced one coulomb of charge here. So, but that's very far. But there's a connection between the two. And later on, we will see how this local conservation of charge happens through the continuity equation, then that would be for the future lectures. Charge is also quantized. Um, electric charge comes in discrete lumps and they are integer multiples of E. The electron has a charge negative E and the proton have a charge of positive E. They have the same magnitude of charge, but the types are different. Uh, e is like uh, 1.6 around that figure times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So, um, but we will 
see the exact uh, value later. So units, um, the Coulomb's law, you have studied this before, force between two charges, Q1 and Q2, the force between them is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon sub O times uh, Q1, charge of the first, times the charge of the second, divided by the distance between them in SI units or meters, kilograms, seconds. This is the formula. But you see in some books, they're also using Gaussian units. And Gaussian units, they are in centimeters, grams, and seconds. And you see Coulomb's law there to be this one. For Gaussian units, they said that the epsilon sub O, this is the per, uh, permittivity of space, um, or permittivity of uh, vacuum, this is equal to 1 over 4 pi. And then if you extend your knowledge to particle physics, you also will find heaviside Lorentz units. And the epsilon sub O here is set equal to 1. And so your uh, Coulomb's law will um, have this form. There's no epsilon here because it's equal to 1. So in some books, you can see this formula. In some books, you can see this formula. In our lectures, you can see this formula because we're using SI units in our lectures. And our main reference, again, is Introduction to Electrodynamics by David J. Griffiths, um, British Hall International Incorporated. Uh, that's the publisher. And it's protected by copyright. And if you want to buy in the future, uh, you can buy it Amazon or you can buy secondhand if, if you want. So that's it for uh, uh, pre the preliminaries of our um, of our uh, lecture series of lectures on electrodynamics. So let's now go to the uh, next set of slides. Um, this will be um, chapter one of the book. Uh, but um, chapter one doesn't really talk about electrodynamics yet, but it talks about the mathematical um, techniques and the mathematical, um, uh, mathematical processes that we're going to do as we study electrodynamics. So for chapter one, uh, we'll be studying about vector analysis, matrices, uh, differentials, and integrals. So uh, don't worry about electrodynamics yet. We will uh, just review the mathematics. And then the next chapters, the succeeding chapters, will be uh, much more easier. So we study first vector algebra and some vectors, vector operations. So here in this figure, um, you're walking four miles north, and then you you walk three miles to the east. You're actually walking a total distance of seven miles, four plus four plus three. <clears throat> but you're not seven miles away from your from the origin. You only have to walk five miles in this direction if you want to go back to your starting point. So this is not ordinary algebra because ordinary algebra would just be adding segments on a straight line. But here you're adding a segment going here in this direction and a segment going in this direction. They're in different directions. So you're adding not an ordinary number, but you're adding two vectors, one going north and one going east. Vectors are different from ordinary numbers because vectors carry direction. They have magnitude and they also carry direction. So you add the magnitudes and at the same time, you also have to manipulate the directions. So in this case, you have four miles 
going north, and then you have three miles going east. And then the sum of that, the sum of that is from here, uh, from, from the starting point, going to the end point is the sum of the vectors. That's five miles northeast. And actually, you can find the sum by using Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, because these are just perpendicular to each other. So that's uh, how vectors are added. It's not, um, it's not ordinary algebra where you you add like four miles plus three miles will just be equal to seven miles, although the distance is seven miles. The person walks walked seven miles, but the sum, the displacement, this is actually called a displacement. The displacement of that person is actually five, only five miles from the starting position. So displacements are straight line segments going from one point to another. Displacement is different from distance. Displacement have direction as well as magnitude. And the magnitude is represented by the length of the arrow. So if you're, if the magnitude is small, then the arrow would be small. And then if the magnitude is large, then the arrow would be large. So vectors, you have two types of uh, numbers. We have vectors and scalars. The scalars are added by ordinary algebra. Four miles plus three miles is equal to seven miles distance walked by the person. So those are scalars. You don't talk about direction in scalars. Scalars <clears throat> are purely magnitude, but vectors, you have uh, magnitude and direction for vectors. Examples of them are velocity, acceleration, force, Momentum, you have experienced these uh, terms. And then for scalars, uh, you only have magnitude. And examples of scalars are mass, charge, density, temperatures, etc., pressure. Um, <clears throat> in here, we denote vectors with bold face letters. So if you see the face letters, that means they are vectors. They have magnitude and direction. And ordinary type letters denote scalars. So for example, the magnitude of vector A, this is a vector, meaning have it has magnitude and direction, is written as uh, A with um, with absolute values, two bars, in between two bars. Or this the absolute or modulus of A, absolute value of A or modulus of A is the magnitude of vector A. Or you can simply write it as A that's not in bold paste. So that's uh, what you have to look at uh, in the future. That That's what you have to watch out in the future lectures because I will not be saying this is vector A because it's already bold face. So bold face means it has magnitude and direction. Or if it's not written in bold face, that's a scalar. So looking at the diagram here, um, you have um, an arrow representing a vector A. Uh, this one. The direction here is some angles northeast or north of east or east of north. So this is A. The this one, this another um, arrow, which is exactly the same length, but exact also exactly opposite direction as that as that of A. This is just the negative of that vector. The negative of the vector is uh, a vector that has exactly the same magnitude, but also opposite, exactly opposite direction. By the way, there's a there's a, a caption in this um, figure. Vectors have magnitude 
and direction but no location. So vectors can be put in iligan. Uh, the vector three meters north in iligan is also the same vector three meters north in Italy, for example. So you can place the vectors anywhere. For as long as they have the same length and the same direction, they are the same vectors. So they have magnitude and direction, but no location. So those are two vectors. And this is how you add uh, two vectors. So say, for example, this is a vector A. This one is vector A. And then this is a vector B. The sum of these vectors are, this is this one. The sum of these vectors is this one. The, the two vectors A and B. So this is the vector A plus B. So you can see that A plus B has a different direction as A. It has also a different direction uh, to that of B. So this one is a product. Um, addition to the play, addition to vectors, you have to place the tail of B, this is the tail of B, to the head of A. This is the head of A, the arrow head of A. The tail of B, connect it with the head of A. And the sum would be the vector from the tail of A to the head of B. So this is the sum of the vector. You can also interchange the order of the vectors. So here is like B, B, plus A, you know that this is the same vector as that vector, and this vector is the same as this vector, and the sum naturally would also be the same. So A plus B is just equal to B plus A. So look at the length, they're the same, the same length in the same direction. So that's what you call um, commutativity of uh, vector sum. So A plus B is equal to B plus A. So vector addition is computative. A plus B is equal to B plus A. These are vectors, don't forget, they have magnitude and direction. Vector addition is also associative, meaning if you add three vectors and you add first uh, A and B, and then you add the C vector, that's just the same as uh, leaving A alone and adding first B and C, and then you add uh, the, the whole three, that's, that's still the same. That's the associative property of vector addition. To subtract a vector, uh, this is just the same as um, if you have A minus B, this is just the same as A plus the negative of B. So look at this figure. This is A. This is A. B is in this direction. So the negative of B would be in this direction, would be going to the left. B is going to the right. So negative B will be going to the left in this figure. So you have A and then you have negative B. So if you get the sum of A and negative B, A plus negative B, so this is just A plus negative B, the sum would be the same as A minus B or the difference of the two vectors. So you have to be careful about the directions of the vectors. Multiplication by a scalar. Uh, a vector can be multiplied by a scalar and the magnitude simply increases or decreases uh, by multiplication of a scalar. So if you multiply two to this vector A, the magnitude will be twice as long or the length will be twice as long as the original vector. This is two A. So if you multiply uh, one half or one fourth to a, the magnitude of a would decrease. The, the magnitude would decrease. It would be very small because 
the original magnitude would be A, but you now have one fourth A. But in this case, you have two A, so the length should be uh, larger or twice the original. But if you have one fourth A, that, that would be very small. If you multiply a negative number, for example, this is negative 2a, then the re direction would be reversed. So it's now going, uh, or it's now slanting downwards. Here is slanting upwards, but for negative 2a, it will be slanting downwards. For uh, scalar, uh, scalar multiplication of uh, vec I mean vectors, it's uh, distributive. It has the property of dist uh, distrib distributivity. And um, if you have vectors A plus B multiplied by a scalar A, scalar meaning there's no direction involved in this number, uh, but here you have direction, you have direction here. If you multiply this, then this is just equal to A times the vector A plus A times the vector B. That is the distributive property of distributivity of, uh, of the scalar multiplication. So that's about addition and subtraction of vectors, but let's now go to the products of two vectors. The first of the products is uh, called the dot product. This is the dot product of two vectors. Then you have, uh, oh, by the way, this is another name for that product, scalar product. And the dot product of two vectors is defined as a dot b. So this is read as a dot b. This is equal to the magnitude of a, no direction, not just magnitude. And then you have b, also the magnitude, times the cosine of the angle, the smaller angle, when you connect them tail to tail. So for example, if you have this vector A and this is vector B, you have to connect them tail to tail. The tail of A and the tail of B is connected here. You find the angle, their angle. This is theta, for example. So the uh, scalar product would be equal to AB cosine theta, where theta is the smaller angle, the smaller angle between A and B or B and A. So note that A and B is a scalar, meaning A dot B has no direction, but A has direction, B also has a direction, but A dot B, the whole thing has no direction. It's just simply the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them, the smaller angle between them. And also the dot product or the scalar product is commutative, meaning A dot B is equal to B dot A. So they are commutative, as in uh, later we will show the commutativity. Um, scalar product is also distributive. Distributive, this, this means that uh, if you have uh, this expression, B plus C, the sum of two vectors, if you dot this with another vector, A, this will just be A dot B, A dot B plus A dot C. That's the distributive property of a uh, scale product. So I hope by now you know what is distributive property. So just like uh, in this case, distributive, meaning what you multiply or what you um, multiply would be just distributed to the terms of the second, of the second, uh, the terms of the second term. So here you have a dot b, and then you have a dot c. So what is uh, the dot product geometrically? So this is just like uh, a dot b is just the product of a the vector A times the projection of B along A. So if you have um, 
a vector A, and then you have a vector uh, vector B uh, in this direction. Uh, you just get the projection of the other vector to another to the uh, to the second vector, the first vector. Then you would uh, get the, that product. So if two vectors are parallel, if two vectors are parallel, then their that product would be just the product of their magnitudes. There will be no cosine theta because theta, if they are parallel, is um, zero. So if the two vectors are parallel, their ang the angle between them is zero. So cosine zero is just equal to one. So your that product will just be the, the product of the magnitudes. But if they are anti-parallel, anti-parallel means that the vector, the first vector has, uh, the second vector has exactly opposite uh, direction as the first. The anti-parallelism angle, I mean, the angle of of the two vectors would be 180 degrees, and cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. So, if you have anti-parallel vectors, then this would just be equal to negative a b because cosine of 180 is negative one. So how would you get the, the magnitude of A? The magnitude of A is that you have you just have to dot the vector with itself. So here you have A dotted to A would just be equal to A square. And this is the magnitude square. So you have to get the square root of this would be uh, the magnitude of the vector. Later on, we'll know how to get the magnitude. So if A and B are perpendicular, meaning they are at, at right angles to each other, so cosine of 90 would be 0. So A dot B would automatically or naturally become, become 0. So example number one. Um, here you have a vector C. What is vector C? Uh, A here, this is vector B and C. A would just be the sum of B and C. So A is equal to B plus C. A is equal to B plus C. This is the sum of B plus C. A is the sum of B plus C. So if A is the sum of B plus C, then C would be the difference of A and B. So if you transfer this B here on the, on the left side, A would just be B plus C or C plus B. Uh, but uh, A, since A is the sum, so you can transfer B on this side, so C would just be A minus B. Uh, so in this example, C is equal to uh, A minus B. Uh, calculate the scalar or dot product of C with itself. So let's look at the solution to that. So you have C dot C. This is the dot product of C and itself. Um, this is equal to uh, a minus b dot to a minus b. So you can do distributive property. Uh, you have a dot with a would be this one. A dot with negative b would be this one. And then b dot with a, uh, negative b with dot with a would be this one. And b, negative b dot with negative b would be positive b dot b. This one is a squared right from here a dot a will just be a square this one and this would also be b square but this one a plus uh, a dot b is just equal to b dot a um, somewhere here this one so you can write everything compactly as c square because c dot c is also c square this is a square this one 
and this is b square which is this one now this is uh two times a b cosine theta because a b a dot b here is equal to a b cosine theta so this is now the magnitude of c so if you get the square root of the if you get the square root of this side of the right side a square plus b square minus 2 a b cosine theta you'll get the magnitude of c so so for example if you have a a vector that is um, for, for this one, for example, um, for this one, four miles, three miles, and then you have, uh, you, you get this um, this magnitude by using the cosine law. So here you have. Um, if you have four miles here, the magnitude will just be squared. So four, four square is 16 plus three square is nine. So this is 16 plus nine minus two AB. Cosine of the angle between them, the, the angle between them would just be equal to 90. So the cosine of 90 is just equal to zero. So everything here, for the first figure uh, would be zero. So this is 16 plus nine equals 25. So that's 25, that's C squared. So you have C equal to five. So that's why you have uh, the magnitude of the sum of the two vectors uh, in figure one um, here to be equal to five here. So that's how you use the formula that you just derived. Um, there's also another product called cross or vector product. And this is different from the scalar product because the vector product produces a vector. Here you have A cross B. This is just the, the, the product is just equal to AB, the magnitude of A and the magnitude of B sine theta again the theta here is the smaller angle between the two vectors when they are placed tail to tail and the n here the direction n n hat n hat is the direction of the vector produced by the uh, vector product there is a direction here direction remember that but the magnitude is of course uh, only a b sine theta the magnitude of this product but there is a direction this is just the magnitude and this is the direction so here in the scalar product you do not have direction scalar product is represented by the dot without direction so this is just a b cos sine theta the theta is the smaller angle between the two and for the cross product, you have sine theta. The small, uh, the theta is smaller angle between the two. But remember, the vector product has a direction n. This is a unit vector, a unit vector with magnitude of one. So this is don't worry about the magnitude, the the magnitude. This is just one, meaning this is just purely direction. This is pointing perpendicular to the plane of A and B. To the plane of a and b so that uh, we will look at the figure how how it would um it would uh go so to determine the direction of the vectors you just have to use your right hand so in this case you have a vector a a vector a we, uh, you cross you cross that with b the direction would be going that way you can use your right hand uh, place it in A, and then you curl your fingers towards B, and that's this, the thumb, will represent the direction of the cross product of the two vectors. So for B, cross A, that would be putting your palm and curl it to A, and that's going to that direction, going out of the page. 
for A cross B that's going into the page uh, in my reference. So <clears throat> uh, the hat here is used to designate unit vectors. Um, so there are two directions, but uh, you have to use the direction of your right hand. So th that's what you call the right hand rule. Also, the vector product is distributive. You have A cross B plus C, for example. Then that would be equal to A cross B plus A cross C. But they are not <clears throat> commutative. Look, B cross <clears throat> A is equal to negative of A cross B. Why? Because they have op opposite direction. As I've said here, A cross B is going this way, is going this way, and B cross A is going that way. They're opposite, meaning some, one of them has to be negative. <clears throat> but their magnitude are the same. The magnitude are the same. And the magnitude is just equal to a b sine theta. But the unit vector would be opposite in direction. So geometrically, A cross B is the area of the parallelogram generated by A and B. <clears throat> Here, you have A and B. You can generate a par parallelogram here. So this is B, and then you can make a projection here, and then A, projection. So if you cross A and B, if, if you cross A to B, or B to A, you will get the area as the magnitude, the area of this parallelogram. So if you cross two vectors that are parallel or anti-parallel, parallel or anti-parallel, their cross product is just equal to zero. Because sine zero, the angle between them is zero. Or sine 180 deg degrees is also equal to zero. So the cross product of two parallel vectors is zero. <clears throat> Now, this is an easier way. The next one is an easier way to get the vector, com I, mean, I mean, the magnitude of the vector. No? Here, you can set a coordinate system, the X, Y, Z coordinate, partition <laughs> coordinate system. So here you have an X axis going in this direction, and then you have a Y axis going in this direction. And then you have a z axis going in the up direction. X and y are perpendicular. Y and z are also perpendicular. And x and z are also perpendicular. The unit vectors associated with the x axis is x hat. The unit vector associated with the y axis is y hat. And the unit vector associated with the z axis is z hat. So you have x, y, and z. These are just unit vectors. Unit vectors have magnitudes of one. One. So they don't interfere with the magnitude as they are multiplied to a number. They don't uh, interfere with the magnitude because then if you multiply one, that just would just be the same number, the same magnitude. But it determines the direction of the vector. So x, y, and z. So if you get an arbitrary vector a, by the way, this has to be uh, bold face, sorry. So a would have three components in the Cartesian coordinates. One of its components would be ax in the direction x hat, ay in the direction y hat, and az in the direction z hat. So in this case, 
<laughs> AX. AX is the projection of this vector A to the x-axis. AY is the projection of A on the y-axis. This is AY. And AZ would be the projection of A on the z-axis. So you have AX here in the x-direction, AY in the y-direction, and AZ in the z-direction. So those are the components of A. Those are the components of A. So you can write your vector A with this form. And then, so all the vectors would be written this way. So you have AX, X hat, AY, Y hat, AZ, Z hat, plus BX, X hat, plus BY, Y hat, plus BZ, B hat, BZ, Z hat for a plus B. So you can write A in this form and B in this form. And if you add them, you just add the components on that. So you group the terms with X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. So in this case, you have AX plus BX, X hat, then AY plus BY, Y hat, and then you have AZ plus BC, Z hat. That's uh, how you add the two vectors with components. And then you have um, vectors uh, multiplied by a scalar. So you have A, this is AX, X hat, AY, Y hat, A, Z, Z hat for a vector multiplied by the scalar A. So this is how you do it. Now, um, we're just we're just uh, having few slides more before we end the class. Um, by the way, x hat that x hat is equal to one because the magnitude of x hat is one. The magnitude of y hat is also one, and the magnitude of z hat is also one. And the angle between x hat and x hat is equal to zero. So if you that x hat with x hat just just equal to one, y hat that y hat is equal to one, z hat uh, that z hat is also equal to one. But x hat that y hat is equal to zero. Why? Because the cosine of the angle between them, which is ninety, is equal to zero. These are perpendicular. Also, x and z are perpendicular, and y and z are also perpendicular, so that's equal to zero. And so, when you dot a with b, then this would be equal to uh, x hat. You distribute everything just like ordinary algebra. Um, the only terms that survives would just be having the x hat, that x hat, y hat, that y hat, and z hat, that z hat, which is equal to one, and um, the the that product between a and b would just be this. So a dot b would just be a x plus b x plus a y times b y plus a z times b z. That's the, and this is again equal to. A, B, cosine, theta. So how do you calculate? This is, uh, this is the last slide now. How do you calculate the magnitude of the vector with components? So here you have, if you want to get the magnitude of A, then you just have to um, that A with itself. So in this case, it would just be AX times AX for here, AY times AY for here, and AZ times AZ for here. So if you want to get the magnitude of A, uh, this is just AX squared plus AY squared plus AZ squared. If you know the components, then you get the square root of it. That would be the magnitude of the vector A. Um, the three-dimensional generalization of Pythagorean theorem. So this is just the Pythagorean theorem. If you have 
two components, then this is the original Pythagorean theorem. But, um, we have three components now, AX, AY, and AZ. So this is a three-dimensional generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. So we will continue this next meeting, um, the next video. Um, I will post the link of this lecture on our MOLE and uh, Google Classroom. So you can rewatch them and please ask your questions. We will interact there in, in our uh, room. And also, I would probably give um, problem sets. I will also post them there. So watch out for the next lecture. Um, see you around uh, by the time. Thank you. See you.